So uh, last year I gave a first presentation about Lumi. Lumi was just a couple of weeks in uh, general availability at that time, at least only the CPU section, not yet the GPU section, which is the main part of the cluster. So this year I'm going to give an update and mostly, I mean, now that we've used EasyBuild for over a year to actually install software based on user requests and so on of where we are with EasyBuild, what the noises and what we like. So Lumi is supposed to be one of the fastest uh, supercomputers in the world. In the last top 500, it was on the third place. I'm not going to go in too much details, but just briefly summarize what I told last year. So it's an uh, HP Cray EX supercomputer manufactured nowadays by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And it has two main session, sections for compute. So one is a CPU section, which we call Lumi C which currently has 1536 uh, two socket AMD Milan nodes. And then the big part of Lumi is what we call Lumi G, the GPU section, which has 2,560 nodes. Each node has four MI250X GPUs each, where GPU is really the package with two compute dice. So the thing that, as we've seen yesterday, shows to Slurm as two GPUs in the talk of uh, Ian Petrus. Uh, the peak vector FP64 performance is supposed to be close to 500 petaflops per second. It also has matrix compute units that also do FP64. So in matrix compute, there's a number that is not often quoted, but it's actually an exaflop machine in peak performance. Uh, so it's roughly one third of Frontier, but it uses the same architecture, at least for the GPU section. Um, so the size is about one uh, tennis field. Uh, this is basically what Lumi looks like. So it's built in a Kayani in an old paper factory where they had a huge hall in which they have three sections in which they can build a containment, which is this part. So it tries to make it even a little look nice, a little bit nice on the outside for Lumi. And then this is the machine as it is inside. I think the picture is a little bit enhanced. There's a bit more reflections in there than I would expect. But you basically got the CPU part here. Then the part that has the name Lumi on it is uh, four rows of GPU racks. And then the black part at the end is everything which is storage, admin notes, login notes, and so on. Uh, that's what it looks today. It's going to be further extended basically because we need compensation for late delivery. So that's going to give another uh, two racks of CPU nodes. And uh, it didn't reach its promised Lindpack benchmark, so they need to add hardware until they reach that benchmark also, because we really want to be in the top 500 as 370 petaflops and not as the 309 or 310 we're at now. Lumi user support is distributed. So Lumi is a Euro HPC system, which means that Europe page, page pays, in this case, half of the uh, build. The other half is uh, paid for by 10 countries in a consortium. Uh, the biggest member, of course, being Finland, but Belgium, uh, which I represent, is actually the second biggest contributor in uh, Lumi. And so there are support specialists in each country that are part of the uh, central team, the central support team, which is called the Lumi user support team. So the abbreviation is actually just my last name. I had to be part of it. Um, Besides level two support, it turned out that we actually also have to supply level one support, which was first meant to be done by other parties, end user training. So we also maintain much of the software portfolio, right? The user documentation of the system. Level three support is supposed to come from other entities, though in practice we do a little bit of that also. If only to train ourselves, and also because those other entities have not always shown up yet. But application enabling methodology support has to come from the local centers, the Euro HPC competence centers. And of course, we have the support of a team at HPE AMD that we also call Center of Excellence. So it's a bit confusing the name. Uh, support for issues with accounts and allocations is purely national. So there is no central allocation system for Lumi. So there is no central allocation system for Lumi. Each of the stakeholders allocate users independently of one another, and there is a joint system to manage all that, uh, or basically two systems. There is one country who has something else. 
So what we have to do is maintain a software stack for a machine which, and my boss is always angry when I say that, but let's be honest, it's a fairly experimental machine. The Rockham software stack is not stable. The interconnect is basically, I mean, the time between crashes is a very nice random number generator and you don't have to wait long <laughs> for the right to get a number out of it. So it's a new interconnect, new GPU architecture, immature software ecosystem for the visualization instead of throwing any AMD GPUs, they threw in some NVIDIA GPUs just to make it fun. And then a mix of Zen 2 and Zen 3, compute nodes are Zen 3, login nodes and visualization nodes are still at Rome. Uh, we've got users that come from 11 different channels, not counting sub-channels. In Belgium, everything consists of more than one, so we have two sub-channels. The Danes do even better. They have six resource allocators that independently allocate users to the system. So it's kind of fun. This has to be done by a two small central support team. There are basically only nine full-time equivalents for all the tasks that we have. In principle, the consortium should contribute in practice. This is not yet really happening, though in Flanders, for instance, we just acquired funding to set up a local support team. One key thing is that everything we do on Lumi is based on the Cray programming environment. It's a key part of our system, and that also means that Clang and LLVM is an important compiler for us. Both the Cray compiler is Clang-based and LLVM-based, and the AMD compilers for CPU and GPU are Clang and LLVM-based. Uh, to make management a little bit fun, and because we were a bit concerned about performance of the file systems, the software stack is actually on four different file systems, each, each mounted on a quarter of the node. So we have a synchronization issue also whenever we install new software. That means that since we are a small team, a machine on which we have to act early, because I mean quickly also, because... Rockham and so on are changing so quickly that our users want new compilers, new software stack all the time, at least the leading edge users. So we go for a small central software stack at the moment with only the high priority libraries, libraries that are used in, as dependencies in lots of packages, and that we really update quickly after the installation of a new programming environment. So basically, in the, this time it took me 10 days, last time it took me like five days to get a new stack up and running. Uh, the other easy configs evolve as needed. So most of the software packages are not installed in the central stack, but in the user's directory. Um, development of those easy configs is driven by request. And sometimes we even have customized setups for users because a single version of a package just doesn't cut it on a system like Lumi. Everybody wants his own version of Gromax. Some people want a special patch applied to it with some special functionality. Um, so in that way, we can cater to that very easy. Managing such an evolution in the central software stack would be very hard. Uh, basically, we cannot install over another package, for instance, while users are using it. And it's even harder if you have to keep four copies in sync. So we go very strongly for personal environments in our setup. Basically, I agree with those people from EC and so on that all users want the central software stack. The problem is they don't all want the same central software stack. They want their software stack central and no other packages. So we already get tickets, even though our software stack is very small. So what modules should I load? I can't really find my way in this mess. Also with that system of Putting more in user environments, we have far less problems with version conflicts and we can move a lot faster when installing things than in a big central software stack. We don't need to be concerned too much about is this package going to work with this and this and this library of this and this and this version of library. No, I mean, if it doesn't work well for that user, we give another version of If they really want another version, I mean, open phone, for instance, who uses from some libraries, very old versions we can easily supply that separately. Um, another argument for personal environments. Again, users say that they want the central environment and then go on, they use Conda, they use containers, they use Python virtual environments. I mean, we see users using personal environments all the time. So what we did is we made a setup with Elmod, an easy build and a nice configuration module. So users don't load easy build directly. They load the module, which we've called easy build user. 
And that configures easy build to build on top of the current software stack in a way that completely integrates with the module system. So basically we build a software stack for each release that we install of the Cray programming environment. So we're currently at uh, 22.12 and 23.03 are our most current ones. So they load the module corresponding to that. And if they download easy build user, there's just a single easy build user module. It configures automatically for that software stack. And moreover, they don't need to keep that easy build user module loaded to see their modules. They only need it to install software. After that, it really looks as if they are in the central software stack. So in, in that way, we still try to give the users the impression of a big central software stack without actually offering one. So I've said most of that. So our software stacks are based on the releases of the HP Cray programming environment. That means that the compilers are not installed with EasyBuild. So in that sense, it's an atypical EasyBuild installation. We have four different compilers, three hardware platforms. Luckily, the number of combinations is not four times three because with AMD, you have a compiler for CPUs, which doesn't work for GPUs. And you have a compiler for GPU, which they say gives suboptimal optimization for CPUs, so you shouldn't use it. And then we've got that third one that we've heard of this morning, which we actually don't have installed on our system. We have no hierarchy in the tool chains, only full tool chains. So tool chains with compiler, MPI, and the math libraries, though actually are thinking about how we could implement something that takes the role of GCC core, simply to reduce the amount of software that we need to install with three compilers or four compilers. Um, and because much software only works well with GCC anyway. So at the moment, we actually fix the version of EasyBuild for a given version of the software stack basically to have an as reproducible environment as possible. And we bootstrap easy build for each version of the Lumi software stack so that those different versions are completely independent of one another. So if something happens to Lumi, we can restart very easily without having to go through a lot of, through a lot of history. Or if a user wants a test stack, it's made completely relocatable. So you can just download two repositories, run a script, and you have a copy of the software stack on a different route in which you can start experimenting. So basically, we offer our easy configs in two central repositories. If you get a handout of the slides, these will actually be links. So there is the Lumi software stack repository for everything that we install centrally. And then there is the Lumi easy build config repository for everything that we support a bit less in the sense we have done less quality checking and so on and use it for user support. And so we also take contributions from other parties in Lumi Easy Build Country. We've had a few, but not that many yet so far. Uh, that's also something that I've already touched. So we have configuration modules for Easy Build to configure for specific tasks, which really is just a single module, but we use the introspection functions of LMOD so that from its position and its name, it can figure out what it should do. So we have an easy build production when we install in the central stack and users cannot even see that module. And we have an easy build user to install software in the user environment, single piece of code for maintenance to make sure that uh, all those modules remain nicely in sync with each other. But it picks up where to install software from its name and its location in the module tree. So we fully exploit hierarchical modules in our mod. And so what the user has to do to install Gromax is basically you load the Lumi software stack. Uh, partition C says, look, I want to install it for the CPU nodes. Load the EasyBuild user module and you just execute the EB command as you would in regular EasyBuild and dash R uh, because I have the robot path not turned on automatically. And that's a version that has an additional dependency plumed. And it runs the installation for you, which I'm not going to show because it takes 20 minutes. So that brings me to uh, the new material. Basically, what I've said so far is a summary of what I've said last year. Um, we actually make quite a lot of use of the system tool chain. That may surprise some people, but for us, because we have no GCC core equivalent, it's an easy way to install software that we want everywhere, even outside of the easy build environment, because you don't need to load any tool chain. The modules don't load any tool chain when they start the software. Um, 
And in that way, we make it available even for users who don't want to use our easy build tool chains. Uh, for those packages to minimize interaction, I actually still use traditional static linking. So I have a separate module with then curses and a few other packages that those things need. Link them statically. Uh, we use that, for instance, for the build tools, because users sometimes ask for a newer version of CMake, even if they don't want to use the uh, two chains that we have. They just want to use the Cray programming environment as is. Well, that's an easy way for us to provide it. So we are thinking of a GCC core equivalent, and even Cray is now seeing, like, look, sometimes users want to mix compilers and making provisions for that in their module system, but we're not yet there, and we basically lack the time to do a lot on that. Something that I couldn't touch last year because we didn't have GPUs at that time, the GPU tool chains, well, it turns out that we really didn't need to do anything special for that or hardly anything special, just load a few additional modules. We do use, so contrary to SPAC, that went to a, a, module a module less setup for uh, the programming environment, we use the uh, Cray wrappers and then you basically don't need to do much. It's the same compiler wrappers, just with a different set of module loaded, and they adapt themselves um, most of the time, but not always, produce correct options for the underlying compilers. So that needed very little work. A question we often have, we often get asked by the Easy Build community is, what do you do with Rockham? How do you get that on Lumi? Well, for us, it's part of the Cray programming environment. So in some sense, we do nothing. The problem is the Cray programming environment is very slow in picking up new versions of Rockham. So at the moment it's 5.2, which they officially, or a version of 5.2, which they officially distribute while we're at 5.4 with 5.5 in the pipeline and probably coming out, it's already in release candidates. So probably coming out one of the next weeks or months. Um, obviously our users, or at least the leading edge users uh, are not happy with those old versions. So that means that we do try to build our own Rockham modules. However, so far we do this from the binaries and we don't try to compile it ourselves. Does this come with problems? Yes, it comes with problems. I mean, so far, most of the time it works for us, but one thing you have to be aware, like any GPU library, you're limited by the driver versions. At some point, I mean, the driver is the one that comes with 5.2 for 5.4. That's still okay. We don't know if that will be okay for 5.5 also. Uh, another problem with Rockham is, and that's why I made a comment this morning, that I doubt that they have a packaging engineer when uh, Patrick Leer spoke, <laughs> spoke about the packaging, packaging engineering. It's full of hard-coded paths. It's improving. There's, they're, they're removing them. Sometimes to version-specific directories, but sometimes also to the generic directory, which then should link to the default version, which is quite problematic because that can have performance implementations. And so far, the major problem seems to be with MI Open, which wants to compile on the fly in some cases, and because of this uses an older compiler than the one it should use. <laughs> I, I said it because I knew that reaction would come. <laughs> so the comment is uh, that uh, someone who's actually working on supporting uh, Rockham in Easy Build said, look, that path open to Rockham is hard coded everywhere, but you don't want it to be hard coded. So it's really uh, tricky when even when you want to compile it from sources to adapt it to uh, the path that you really want to see there. So concerning the tool chains, I do think we can do a better job with more settings in tool chain ops, but that would need us to gain more insight in how programs that use Rockham will ultimately use CMake, will ultimately use auto tools and so on. That may still be converging. One problem that we have had while developing those tool chains, what I bumped into is that EasyBuild doesn't really distinguish a lot between C-based languages. And so, for instance, the CXX, or there is a, a CSTD or so variable in the toolchain ops, which is used for both C and C++. And, I mean, sometimes we've had cases where we wanted to set both and then had to do it via C flags and via CXX flags. The reason why I think that this may become a bigger problem in the future is if we want to support HIP, SQL, OpenCL. These are all C language families, uh, languages. 
Another problem that we've run into is that there is no way to add options to LD flex, except if there are minus capital L options. And it turns out that for linking with HIP, we sometimes needed to add options there to work around problems elsewhere in the Cray programming environment mostly, but they may even be needed in general. So now, I mean, we do it with minus X linker in uh, C flex and CXX flex, and usually that works because most config scripts also add C flex or CXX flex to the linker uh, options, but it may become a problem. Yes, that's that's what we that's another thing that we sometimes do, but it's it's not as nice as setting it in tool chain ops. And in fact, with uh, GPU programs in general, we often still need to manually uh, work with those variables. Yes, that also exists, and we, I know it exists, and I use it actually. Yeah. But for some things, it would be nice to be able to set it as a tool chain opt also. Because that makes a better abstraction towards the person who writes the easy config. Yeah, so uh, the remark was actually that there is extra C flex, extra CXX flex, and maybe there should be an extra LD flex, and it may even exist, but I'm not sure. Uh, second thing which is very important for us in Lumi is documentation. Documentation is really everything. So we make a lot of use of any easy build feature that can be used to produce documentation. And so one thing is that on an HPE Cray system, users really need to learn to read man pages again because so much of the Cray environment is documented through man pages and documentation that you cannot easily find on the web and so on. So uh, we do make a point of when we install software with easy build and we see that it comes with man pages, making sure that those are also on the system. But we also developed, and I mean, develop is a big word because it's really a very simple thing. We've got something which we call the Lumi software library, which we generate from markdown files stored with the easy configs. Why? User documentation is separate, but we figured out that if you want to document the package or something that you did to configure it and, or you want to warn the user for a restriction, if you put that in a documentation away from the easy configs, you update the easy configs and you don't update the documentation because it's not part of your uh, work cycle. So we now have it started with one file, a readme.md, which actually had long before uh, we even thought about uh, automating this in a Lumi software library. Then a second file was added because we figured out, look, readme.md is more for the technical persons. Let us write a user.md about documentation more at the user level. And then CSC became very concerned about software licenses and wanted us to document those better also. So there's no actually even three files. And that is the result. It's a website that looks like that. So we've got an alphabetical list of the packages. And for instance, for the Lumi VNC module, it will show you that this is pre-installed on the system. It basically gets that information from knowing where the easy config is. It will show you the license information, user documentation, pre-installed modules, and those easy configs. So you can even click on it and see the easy config and see what has happened and then the some technical documentation, not all those parts have to be there. Some parts can be missing. And even at the very bottom, but that's, it can even show you archived easy configs if you have old versions that we haven't used, basically because if you have a package that disappears because everything is archived, you will still find it in the software library and you will still be able to find back its uh, easy configs and either try to do it yourself if you have sufficient feeling of how easy configs work or contact support and say, hey, you once had that package there. Can you reinstall it in that or that tool chain? So they can find it there. Problem that we have is that we cannot exploit the LMOP what is lines as much as we would like to. EasyBuild generates a lot of those lines automatically. But that gets broken as soon as you use the what is keyword. Then it replaces, then it only uses the ones that you define. And what is for us a reason to use the what is keyword, that's the use of the description keyword. Well, these lines have a description, a line that start, they all have lines that start with a key and then a value. And an important key is description because that's the line that LMOP uses when you ask, for instance, just what is the summary of all, mo uh, sorry, not what is module spider, the summary of all modules. And then 
for all versions of the module, it will pick just a single what is description. So that description that is used from the what is line should really be valid for all modules. But you want to add more description about specific configurations. For some software packages, you need to have multiple configurations. You want to add that in the description, or you just want to give a bit more description in module help. So it would be very nice to have something that is one solution could be to have a keyword short description that is used for the what is line and a description that is used for the help block. And if you don't want to break compatibility with current easy configs, if you use description, then short description is not present. I don't think you run into compatibility problems. So that might be an easy solution to that problem. Yeah, so the remark that was made that there was a time that there was a bug in LMOP that for what is in module spider, it took combinations from information from two different uh, versions of the package. No, it's more consistent, that's true. But even the current what is one, the current what is keyword isn't optimal for us because it doesn't really enforce the key value ID, which I think is a pity in the current syntax. And as soon as you use it, Easy build, easy build doesn't add the data that it does automatically anymore. And it's so nice that it automatically adds the name, the version, and so on. And just an idea suggestion, not important for me. I mean, I found it useful as a developer. When I worked on the HLRS system, which is actually using that package from the competition that we just heard about, one of the funny things that was in the what is information of the module was that it, it was built with all the tools of CMake, the arguments that were used for configure script or CMake were in a special what is line. So as a developer, I could see, look, that library is configured this way and I could see very quickly without going in SPAC to figure out what concretization was used. I could very easily see how the package was built and I could see whether it was suitable for me or whether I needed to rebuild, rebuild the library in a configuration that was more suited. That's just a little thing, I know the high priority thing, but it might be just, just a nice idea about something else that you could add to the what is line. Easy blocks. Easy blocks on Lumi are a nuisance. They often fail, and sometimes in ways that can be avoided. And that is, to my feeling, a little bit the result of the idea in Easy Build that everything has to be tested. And if it's not tested, it's not allowed. So there is in two ways that they are annoying for us. And one is if they start testing for compilers. If it is this compiler, then do this. If it is that compiler, then do that. Then of course the great compilers and so on are not there. And it fails. And sometimes this is understandable because you sometimes you can expect that for every compiler you will need a different flag. But suppose like at some point, I think it was G4.9 or 10, you needed to add an option with some packages that relied on some behavior that had changed in uh, G4.9. I mean, if you then start your test with if G4 Tran, then do this, else if into then do nothing, else bomb. I mean, that's like annoying people without without a good reason to annoy people. And we've, we've run into such things more than we like. And the second thing is there should be more consistency in testing for modules. I mean, testing if modules are loaded or not. And this should always be done through metadata and not through module names. Sometimes they test for loaded modules. Sometimes they test modules test or easy blocks test for the presence of EB root variables. It should always be EB root variables because then it's compatible with the external modules also. And the most annoying easy block, so one that we have customized on Lumi, is the Maison Ninja easy block. I don't know who wrote that. It may have changed by now. But when I made that change, it was like, first we check whether the Maison and the Ninja module are loaded. Then we check whether the root variables exist. And we're not happy yet. We'll even explicitly check whether the Maison and the Ninja executable are there. I mean, how paranoid can you be? And that's a problem on Lumi because we wanted to put those in a module that has a different name. And something that would also be great just for compatibility with easy blocks, if there would be a way to add metadata 
even if it doesn't make much sense from a model point of view to OS dependencies. Suppose you want to use the Encursus library from the system, for instance, if that you could just have a file that sets an EB root and curses to user lib or so, or to slash user and an EB version to the version that is on the system, so that you could, I mean, so that the easy blocks that check for incursus would be happy. And I give the incursus example in particular because on SUSE you're also hit by the symlink versions or by the version info in the libraries, and it is not solved by adding that argument to the configure line. I don't know what SUSE does, but they seem to be using a patch somewhere that adds even older versions to the symbols in the library, and they are actually used in some of the tools that come with SUSE. Bart? Yeah, actually, it's a complicated thing. Uh, we, we have to explain to people Yeah, but that's precisely what I mean here with OS dependencies that it should be nice to be able to add such a thing more in a more automatic way. So that you can use the so the Bart made the remark that they have they called it the opposite problem, but because they sometimes use libraries from the compatibility layer in their uh, not easy, but their easy like setup that uh, the digital alliance in Canada uses. That they also have the problem of failing easy blocks because they don't find the metadata and so have to explicitly set the root variables. So this corresponds to what I said that it would be great to have such a feature to uh, either an extension of OS dependencies or a separate file. Like we have the external module files already for the things that do not come via modules where we can add uh, metadata specifically for our system. The next thing, that slide is probably already outdated because we've heard about one or two other solutions already uh, in this talk, but we're getting very concerned about both module and directory health. Too many modules and too many, too many subdirectories in paths, too long LD library paths, search paths, and so on, which really on a system of Lumi, if you start an application on 500 nodes and they all start hammering on the Lustre metadata server, to go through a path that contains 100 different directories. Um, that's the way to get your file system to slow down. Of course, there is a very nice argument in favor of splitting up in as many modules as possible, and that's you get more manageable chunks for installation. But sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's really too ridiculous. So arguments that I have against splitting up, we shouldn't use this capacity as an argument anymore, like we want to keep our installation as small as possible. It's not this capacity that is expensive, it's the IOPS. If you have your long paths, you create way more IOPS, and it's those that make your file system expensive. Same with long path variables, long link lines, they are also terrible for developers. If you have like, if you run into a problem in installing a software package and you see that configure has added like a link line which basically fills your screen that you need to ask your boss for a bigger monitor to see what's going on, then obviously that's a problem there. Also, some software expects some components to be together. And so in the past, not only because we use Cray NetCDF, but I have had problems with NetCDF that expected the Fortran interface and the C interface because the Fortran interface then links to the C interface to be together in the directory. So I don't understand why that has to be split up because the library names are perfectly compatible. That would fit perfectly well in a bundle, for instance. Another thing that I've seen is that it's so easy to overlook dependencies. Not all easy configs contain all possible dependencies. And the problem is if a library happens to be on the system and you haven't linked it via an easy config, it may still be picked up by the configure script. And so all of a sudden, you have software that's configured differently than you expect. And differently from the configuration that has been tested when designing the easy config. So all of a sudden you may run into problems that never occurred on the, on the test system on which easy build was tested. Also, what's the point of having packages in separate modules if you want to have only one version of each? 
you don't really save space, at least not for the basic packages, because they are installed everywhere anyway. And like having some of the compression libraries together can actually help you to work around circle dependencies, where the tools that come with the compression libraries support each other's formats. There is definitely such circle dependencies in the graphics libraries. And maybe installing those as one module with graphics tools, one module with compression tools, might even make the programs that you generate. Of course, I know, I see, I see what you're thinking. It has lots of disadvantages also doing it that way. But uh, I'm not sure that the current solution is optimal. So non-arguments in favor of splitting up, better visibility of what is installed. I'm not going to speak for uh, the Tickle-based version of uh, modules. I'm not familiar with that one. But on our system, on Lumi, we learn people to use Module Spider, which is an extremely powerful tool. And actually, when I develop bundles, not now because we have an old version of LMOD, which has a bug where you cannot disable the display of the list of extensions. And I don't want to make it too long. But even for a bundle, I sometimes just manually add a line with the components of the bundle that then show up in uh, as extensions of a package so that they are found by module spider and even without doing that if you make sure that they're in the proper place of the what is lines module spider or at least module keyword module spider not module keyword definitely finds them the argument that you shouldn't install more than is really needed also doesn't make too much sense it's not the disk space that expensive it's the iops that you need to save on and i think everybody who has a big cluster system has already run into trouble with uh, too much load on the metadata servers linux distributions do we too so why would not we not mimic that well there's one important difference linux distributions still install those different packages in the same directory and of course some distributions target very small systems where you really want to fine-tune what you're installing but that also shouldn't be an issue for HPC systems. And EC is probably targeting workstations also, but even there, because the caching is on a per file basis, it won't make a difference. If ease of installation in more manageable chunks is the argument, then maybe we need to think about a better way than the current bundle for bundling installations rather than using more modules. Just food for thought. I know it's not something that can be realized quickly or will be realized quickly, but uh, it's something that we think about. Then there's a little tool written at CSC that I want to tell about because it also interfaces with uh, or links to some other stuff that we've heard about already. So CSC for Python and Conda on their own systems and also on Lumi, we basically tell users not to use Conda or not to use put to do make large Python installations or R installations. Uh, basically, and we, we actually limit them in the number of files that they use. And if their argument is, I want to use Conda, they don't get more files for their account. Um, so it's a tool that's written by a, uh, one of the support persons of CSC. Um, it aims to reduce the load on the Lustre metadata servers. And on their own system, they claim that for many Python scripts and so on that you run afterwards, you get a 30% speed increase. Uh, their approach is that they start from a minimal singularity container, which is OS dependent. Um, but there's really almost nothing in there. The main reason for it is that it's used to pack a SpudgeFS file that contains your whole Conda installation or your whole Python installation. So they have a tool, they have a command that out of requirements.txt file or a Conda environment file does the installation in the temporary disk space, packs it in SpudgeFS and then creates wrapper scripts for the commands and the bin subdirectory so that users don't even need to know most of the time that they're working with the container. Works quite nicely and the GPU support is not yet optimal. We need to work on that. But it's very useful on Lumi because Lumi doesn't even allow fake root. So you're very limited in what you can do in building containers on Lumi itself. That tool works around that limitation. So on Lumi, we use the Cray provided Python and packages. So the NumPy, the SciPy, and the Pandas comes from Cray and are properly optimized using the Cray libraries. I've actually been thinking about ways to interface that with EasyBuild because one of the nice things would be if you make such a package with Lumi Container Wrapper, as the module is called, or Tupu, as the tool is called in Finnish, um, it would be very nice that you also get a module for it. 
So we've been thinking about ways to interface, but basically complete lack of time to do it. So nothing has happened yet. And if you're interested in the tool, the link will be in the slides. It's public domain and it should be not too hard, I think, to configure for a different system. It's basically a configuration file in which you describe, uh, for instance, which container to use and a few other things. The next thing which I always wonder, and I've discussed it already with a few people during coffee, where is LLVM and where is MPIG? Why? Well, support on LLVM is quite limited at the moment. There's no common tool chain based on it, except if you call the new Intel tool chain that you're building, which is based, I mean, Intel new compiler is basically LLVM. It's also understandable due to the confusing state of Heartland support. There's the old flang, the new flang, which is not really ready yet, the old flang, which is not very good. Uh, Intel has just moved its own Fortran compiler on top of an LLVM backend, but it's really its own compiler otherwise. Same with Cray Fortran. So when it comes to Fortran, it's still a mess. But whatever way you turn it, it's the number one compiler base at the moment for development of HPC compilers. Almost every commercial vendor, if not every commercial vendor, is using it. Even NEC, for instance, which for its vector machines, rebuilt its own compiler when they launched the Tsubasa architecture, Aurora architecture, is also working on an LLVM port at the moment. And outside HPC, it's even more to when I talk to people of iMac, for those from Belgium, they know iMac, it's a big lab on microelectronics and related architecture. They said, hey, are you only thinking of switching now as an HPC community? We make the switch from a GCC to Clang in 2011. So in the embedded world, it's also all uh, flung, which means that for those CPUs that actually come from the embedded world, you're thinking of ARM, you're thinking of RISC-V. The main development is also happening in the LLVM ecosystem. Same with GPUs, it's the basis for all GPU compilers. If you look at Rockham, Data Parallel C++ from Intel, the compilers from NVIDIA, they're currently all built on uh, LLVM. And we don't do nothing with it, or hardly anything with it in uh, easy build. And the second thing for me is where is MPIC? I know if you look at the vendor MPIs, there's some that are derived from OpenMPI, there's others that are derived from MPIC. And the ones that are derived from MPIC, my impression is that they are probably mostly with the network vendors. Because all network vendors except Mellanox work nowadays with LibFabric rather than UCX. Cornelis Network, for instance, is also switching to LibFabric. That seems to be the more open library compared to UCX. And in fact, one of the technology people, the technology monitoring people at CSC basically call OpenMPI just a wrapper around UCX. Which is a bit strong, but if you look at GPU support in OpenMPI, it basically relies on UCX. If you don't have UCX transport, you don't have support for things like direct GPU and so on. So really for us, MPIC is an important implementation. And the next slide was one that I wrote during the EasyBuild Conf call four weeks ago, which started with like 10 minutes of bashing spec, which I heard some arguments that I really think are not right. You can compare spec and EasyBuild in many different ways, of course, and we had a talk about it last year, making a comparison. When I look at it in the context of Lumi, I have some colleagues who work with spec on Lumi, and then some colleagues, we've got a team that does everything with EasyBuild. And the thing is that our experience is that with spec, we often have a solution much quicker that makes the user happy. And then I'm comparing someone who's experienced with spec with the speed of someone who's experienced with easy build. Of course, our case is special because we cannot use the common tool chains. We have our great compilers. That, of course, slows down the process a little bit. So the comparison may not be valid for everybody, but it's something to think about. And then one of the arguments that always comes that, yeah, the SPAC API changes all the time. Okay, we've just heard that they're planning a major change, but in the past two, three years, it has been pretty, pretty stable, actually. I mean, how could they maintain 7,000 packages if they change the API continuously? And the other thing is the SPAC API is way more readable than the one for easy blocks. When I bump into a new package that I don't know how to install, I'm not sure about whether the EasyBuild support is ideal for us or whether the spec support is ideal. 
when I want to learn about these dependencies to get an estimate of uh, how long it will take us to prepare that for the user. Typically, the spec sources tell me a lot more, much quicker than the easy build source. The readability of the spec source is really better. And so the criticism that you're building something, that when you're building something with spec, it's basically an untested configuration. That's also an argument that I hear a lot. That's also only partly true. I mean, spec has its quality control also. So of course, they cannot test any combination. It's a combinatorial problem spec. But very often, it just works. And when it does, quite often, easy build will not beat it. Because you have all the flexibility while in easy build, I mean, you have to live with the, the set of dependencies that are predetermined by the tool chain. In spec, if the user says, yeah, I need that, but I want to use it with that, you can just try. Maybe it's an untested configuration, but who cares if it works in the end and the user is happy. And also, given all the variations in Linux and underlying hardware requiring different compiler optimizations, or the risk that EasyBuild picks something up from the environment which was not in the environment where you tested, basically means that the EasyBuild recipes are also not fully tested. Testing software tools fully is not possible. We have to live with that. We will have failures, whatever CI you implement. It's impossible to have a CI that captures all problems in software installation tools. There's one small thing in that. Yeah. There's one small thing in what we, I think, I don't say it's close attention to spec, but one thing we do a lot more than what spec does is run test suite. Yeah. So even, even though we may be picking up stuff accidentally from the OS, and I think that's the case with spec. Yes, definitely. Um, because we run the test suite, mm -hmm. we're probably going to pick up more problems. That's something mm -hmm. like Spikeworks is a, is a good and a bad example because we spend a lot of time going through the, the Spikeworks test, and even if one or two out of the 80,000 fail, we're going to yeah, but still, yeah, and, but still, you've got all those packages that don't come with test I'm, suites. I'm not sure if <laughs> often tests actually. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to say either yes or no. If uh, Todd is still in the call, he can write it in the comments. He's already disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> I knew he wanted to listen to my talk because I told him I would say a few things about spec also. Also, if you want to add another package to an environment, the concretizer may come up with a very different solution, forcing you to reinstall a lot. I'm not sure that is true. He didn't say much about it today, but as far as I know, it tries to take into account what is installed already, if that is possible. Of course, you may have new conflicts that then require you to go for a completely different solution. That's true, but the thing is, easy build in those cases will also not always be able to come up with a nice solution. If you want to combine package A with package B in different versions, it may be that package A is supported in 2020A, package B in the version that you want is supported in 2022A, you also end up reinstalling two tool chains, dependencies in two tool chains. So it's also not optimal unless you start editing those easy conflicts to move them to a different tool chain. So which is then the better package from a user's perspective? All the user cares about is having a working environment and respect he may even end up with an environment where he can use those tools without loading new modules in between. In easy build, they may end up in two different tool chains. Another thing is a flexible tool whose developers don't feel the need to test everything may be better prepared for the Cambrian explosion phase we're in. That's something that was touched yesterday also uh, by Ian, who showed us how much new types of hardware is coming up. And in some of those cases, I mean, the way you install for AMD GPUs, quite often it's the NVIDIA installation procedure, which is actually sent to Rockham instead of to CUDA. But you basically use the same variables. Then your installation procedure for CUDA may not be tested with Rockham, but it may just work, not always. But if it works, you have a happy user. And the other thing that I'm a little bit concerned about is that sometimes I have the feeling that bashing the competitor can make you blind for your own shortcomings. Easy Build has many fantastic features, but it has its shortcomings also. And we need to be aware of that and not be blind for that. And not do something because the competition does it in another way. 
And then there's always Kenneth, who then comes up with his remark. Maybe we should meet somewhere in the middle. Spec and easy build are really on opposite ends of the spectrum. Spec the very flexible tool, but for individual and face, I mean, put the emphasis on untested configurations and then easy build with fully fixed but well tested configurations. So maybe we need to meet somewhere in the middle. Well, I agree. I agree for 100%. But well, you shouldn't be blind for what's going on with SPAC in the past few years. I think SPAC is taking that middle position already with the, with the environments feature. You can actually run it through the concretize, and then we've seen that .log file, which we showed us today, which is like an ideal way of transferring a completely concretized environment to a different system where you can still build it optimized for that particular system. Which is exactly what we want to do with easy conflicts. You've got a fully fixed configuration, you want to port it to another system and install it, but then optimize for that particular system. SPAC is doing that also. So I even think often about how to make easy build a bit more flexible. So that's why I made that remark about all those let us try uh, things. And like we use a script that uh, we have from CSCS to change the Cray tool chains to a different one when we update to a new uh, thing. I have my own things to change versions of dependencies, but it relies on something very awkward. I define them as variables elsewhere and then use those variables in the dependency statements rather than versions so that I don't need to parse those dependency things. Uh, Sometimes it would be nice, I think, to really have a file with versions or something like a database with versions that you want to use of all packages and refer to that database when you build easy builds. So something like templates or so on in the future. Maybe this is something to think about, not for easy build 5, but for easy build 6 or easy build 7. Or maybe we should then call it easy build X because it's so grammatically different and because X is popular nowadays. Um, and we should be careful that we don't move even more to an extreme position and make things difficult. Easy for me is an opportunity and a threat. It's a big opportunity because it means extra person power and all person power for easy development is good for easy build also because easy build is such an important tool within easy. I'm a bit concerned that it's going to put even more focus on a single big software stack and features to manage that. While I'm not convinced that a big software stack is the solution for the future. I mean, just look at what's happening with Python and so on, where you have all those version conflicts where people need virtual environments. We're very close to ending up in that situation with regular packages also. Packages that are left behind and need old versions of libraries combined with newer packages that need new versions of libraries. And the thing that I'm most concerned about, and that's why I asked that question about support, if you cannot figure out a proper support model for easy that keeps the users happy, it may show off negative on easy build also because easy and easy build are so close, even just the way the name sounds, that if users don't like easy, it may turn, I mean, they may just link it so hard with easy build that they don't like it, easy build either. And I mean, I made the remarks that are on that slide. So some thoughts for me, but that then from the perspective of Lumi, and I've actually discussed this also with my uh, both of the user team. But I mean, finding a user-friendly way to build on top of EC will be critical. That's also, I mean, that was said today, everybody realizes. But I think other distribution models is also something that should be thought of. Not every site is ready to set up a cache. You need a budget to buy that cash, and even though that's not that expensive, it's an out of line budget, and it's not always easy to find that. So CSCS has a setup for uh, LHC Atlas that, for our case, could be inspiring. I think they just copied the whole repository from uh, from CERN. Extra demons is not always an option, and that's particularly true on Cray. Cray really hates demons on the compute nodes. Basically, because they provide OS jitter and limit scalability. So, on our GPU nodes, we have one of the cores turned off because it turned off that some services of Rockham provided too much OS jitter and they couldn't reach their scalability benchmarks. Um, obviously, this gives a very strange combination with 63 cores and one chiplet with seven and seven chiplets with eight cores, while you have to do a careful mapping between cores and GPUs to get optimal performance 
of unified memory, so that's not a happy solution if you have to do such things. Also on Lumi, specifically putting stuff in slash OPT is not an option. That's managed by the, well, we have a wall between the sysadmins and the people who do the applications for the users. And we both have our directories to play in. Also slash OPT is built by the Cray management environment and they want to interfere as little as possible with that to put extra stuff in it. So a native build with or without the compatibility layer may be a better solution for a system like Lumi. The compatibility layer is actually a nice idea, I think, to get, uh, to get rid of some of the, the problems that you have of the different Linux versions. So that's probably something that should stay in in such a setup. Another thing is that's taken from a slide from Kenneth from his State of the Union two years ago. Look at the community. We all know that slide too well. The community of Easy Build the community of stack, but then look at how EuroHPC is working. EuroHPC has plenty of money for machines, very little money for support close to the machine. So in Lumi, we're 9 FT and we're in a luxury position if you compare us to the petascale centers. If you hear who they complain, Lux provide and so on, how they complain about not having any funding for support while being expected to support the users, it seems that, I mean, to me, it looks like EuroHPC is more favoring strong communities that do development and support near the user rather than near the supercomputer. So they have their centers of excellence that are domain specific. They have their national competence centers to bring support close to industry. But they have very little money for support of the big machines. So to me, that looks like their ideal community looks more like this community than like this community. To me, I think we will need to find ways to make easy build more attractive also to software developers, to scientists directly, and to work with those centers of excellence and so on to uh, provide ways that they can distribute their packages or install scripts for their packages in easy build. Yes, and that's where the opportunity is, but that's yeah. yeah, just so the remark was just made that easy is also funded through Euro HPC, the multi X scale center of excellence that we've heard. That's true, but uh, again, it's going to be difficult to get everybody behind one single software stack because of all possible version conflicts and so on that you will land in the whole amount of synchronization that's needed between teams. You basically need to set up the base of a software stack, fix versions there before you can start building other applications. I mean, see how slow it is. I mean, how much time it has taken to start up the 2022 20, B software stack. It's still always about no, I mean, there were also technical problems then with Python and so on, but it slowed down the, the rollout considerably. So that brings me to my conclusions, and I'm already over time, I think. So easy build on Lumi is really not a typical easy build installation because we don't control the whole environment with easy build, but work on top of the uh, Cray programming environment. Easy build works for us, but probably with a bit more pain than needed, for instance, with the easy blocks. Despite my nice remarks about SPAC, we do actually continue to invest in easy build. And whenever we have to build something, when it, it doesn't work out of the box, we don't build package.py files in SPAC. We still build for easy build. We develop for easy build. But I have to admit that SPAC has been really good for some users on Lumi. Also for the GPU software, they're way farther than, uh, than we are. Users needed some time to adapt to the personal environment ID, but I think now they see the benefits and many users really appreciate that they can build their personal environment, even with easy build. Some still consider it difficult, but most users, specifically because when we make those easy configs in our own repositories, they have been tested on the system. So they are far less likely to fail than generic easy configs on a new system. And I've mentioned lots of things for improvement. So for us, we like the system tool chains, which unfortunately are not a full tool chain. The CCXX issues, 
you definitely have, if I would look into my, my log of wish list, there's a lot that's very trace specific that I didn't even create here. You could also argue that the AMD GPU support is something which is becoming important, of course, but I mean, so far we can live with it. I've shown you, I mean, documentation through modules. We have some issues there. It's a very nice feature of Visibuild. I don't want to be negative about that feature, not at all. It does much better than SPAC in documenting modules. Because you, have, you do it in your easy config, it's very easy to make specific documentation for each module without having to write hooks where if you have this configuration, then add this configure, then add this thing to the documentation and so on. So easy build does really good there, but it could do even better. The issues we have with easy blocks, the concerns that I have about module hell and metadata server loads, concerns I have about missing support for LLVM and MP. And okay, sometimes, it's good to make jokes about SPAC, of course. It's so fun to make jokes about SPAC. I like them also. But you shouldn't be blinded by those jokes. And sometimes I have the idea that you think SPAC cannot do that, SPAC cannot do that. But I mean, really, SPAC does a lot more than sometimes we realize. So keep your eyes also open for upcoming threats, like I mean, if easy doesn't do well, will that be negative for easy build or not? Euro HPC and their model, will EasyBuild find its place in there? Of course, there is Easy, but if big centers would be moving en masse to SPAC, then you have a problem. So that's it, basically, yeah, that's my last slide. Right. I hope I was not too controversial. <laughs> we're, we're a bit over time, but we have some buffer uh, with Sam's talk as well. I don't think Sam needs a full hour. Um, we do? Okay. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions for Kut? In the room, or I'm looking at Simon for Zoom, or? No, there were several Slack questions already Slack. asked during the talks. Yeah, so. yeah, there are. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah question. Yes, but that means that you will repeat the comment. So uh, the comment was made that it's good to have two tools and some competition is always good and two tools that do not work the same way that target slightly different environments. That's true, I agree. And competition is important. We've seen that way too often that otherwise things are not further developed. But it means that you must find ways for easy build to survive. And if you look at the comments, for instance, that were made by one of the referees to the IAC proposal, or if you look at the growth in SPAC and number of contributions, which I may be mistaken, but it looks like the, the graphs were a bit steeper than for easy build. That's, that's ECP, right? Yeah. SPAC is a lot more funding than development than easy build. Yeah. For development. But that's a big, uh, I mean, that's a big concern. Will it survive and will it be attractive enough to a big community? And not only the small centers, it should not become the tool for the small centers. It should remain relevant for the big centers also, because that's where money for development and influence to push your HPC to put money in that development will have to come from. Yeah, and, and, and Loom, well, so the comment was um, we start supporting or paying more attention to large centers, then the small centers will not be happy anymore because that, that it's not doing the thing, or it doesn't have the focus that they would like. I think Lumi is a good example of that. Lumi is so special that there's lots of stuff missing in Easy Build mm -hmm. that could be a lot yeah. better for Lumi, and it's not there because Lumi is like this, this special, this special case, right? So it's, it's difficult to find a balance. And see, to, to some extent, CSES was in that same boat with, with Pitt Dane, let's say, mm -hmm. eight years ago. 
uh, when we started working on the on the initial trade support for easy build we did that because first of all we had the time for it back then it was fun to do and it was nice to get our foot in the door in a big center like csas but that's not something we can we can keep doing right unless there's access now yeah but there too you see the same discussion yeah. as uh, as in lumi should we go with SPAC? should we stay with easy build no there are strong opinions in both directions yeah. Oh yeah, we can sure. Yeah, try not. Yeah, top. You should be able to unmute. Oh yeah. So I was just gonna <clears throat> bring up one thing because people also seem to have the misconception that SPAC is mainly funded by ECP. It's not. It's funded by ASC, and ASC is the Advanced Simulation and Computing Program out of NNSA, um, which is not going away anytime soon. We're going to we're going to lose a chunk of funding at the end of ECP, but it's likely to be replaced by the sustainability program that's going to be in place after ECP, which is still being worked out. So I don't think we're um, we're not going anywhere. Um, I totally missed that comment. But I'm not going to bash back now. I'll try not to. <laughs> so he was talking about the funding and that it comes from a different channel than you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, on the bashing, by the way, I, I'm not sure you should call it bashing. We make jokes, but and and Todd and I definitely talk all the time, and many people. Well, you can't see that because we talk directly all the time. Yeah, but specifically so, that easy build meeting. Yeah, but that's a, think, that's an easy. I think then I heard some comments that really were not. Yeah, right. and and that's informal, right? So yeah. that's not recorded, and yeah, maybe maybe <laughs> things are a bit more loose then. Um, but yeah, we've we've always been very welcome to have to have Todd on at the meeting, um, to get to give updates, and we're very open to have that discussion. So that that's important to mention as well. Sam, you had a comment or a question? So the comment Sam has is there's indeed threats and opportunities, but maybe this is an opportunity to let Lumi collaborate closer with EasyBuild and try to fix some of these uh, issues. And then, then, yes. you're, then you're back at the manpower problem. Yes, well, partly the manpower problem and partly, I mean, I'm happy to contribute our tool chains, for instance. Mm -hmm. But that has to be found. But it's yeah. kind of, I mean, they are incomplete because they are only tuned to Lumi. The programming environment for Intel, for instance, is missing and the NVIDIA support. So having to add this, okay, I could ask for an account on PC Dane and try to do it there, but uh, or wait until the new Alps is completely ready to test that. But it's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, and I, I, I see, I mean, there were many points raised that we should follow up on, too, like like the easy blocks and... I mean, you, yesterday you talked about policies. Yeah. That's precisely something that should go in the policies. What is good practice in writing easy blocks? What yeah. is good practice in... Uh, Probably something you have to yeah. figure out. And it's not only going to help Lumi, it's going to help Easy and... and it's helped everybody. And yes. the Alliance we, as we, well. We've heard yeah. Bart also, who had similar issues that could yeah. be solved that way. Yeah, so there are just many, many stuff that you brought up here that we should we should come back to and follow up on. Yeah. There's one one or two more comments in the back. Luca? Okay. Just a comment. We have in the discussion for the working for use of more in the past we say support was marginal somehow. Then we say that it's one percent. That's why we we actually did not contribute back to the main Mm -hmm. Oh, I used I used that extensively. My two chains are a copy of the the ones you use on Iger that yeah. I then further refined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. So maybe it takes too much effort or too much time to put stuff back centrally, mm -hmm. especially for special systems like like they have at CSPS. And that that's something I think I agree with. If if people want to do the effort to contribute something back, it has to be a win-win. It has to be a win for the central easy build community. It has to be a win for the site that's doing that. If that's not the case, just have your own repository with your own customized easy blocks or hooks or configs or even tool chains or whatever you need. And that's absolutely fine. But like another thing that makes it difficult for me to contribute back an easy block is that I have no way to test it, at least not on Numi within the regular easy build environment. Of course, any change I made, I should make sure that it still works for regular easy build also. Yeah, well, I, and I, then I need to rely fully on the CI, which is, and you get the error message, it's diff more difficult to debug them and you can do it on your sure. own system. Yeah, yeah. It, it does mean more effort, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. also non-standard actually at the moment. There's, there's lots of stuff within the VSC you can still play on as well. It has also diverged at some point yeah. because we missed things in easy build. Kaspar, yeah. you had something yeah. else? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to be very clear, both the CSES repositories and our repositories are completely open and available to the outside yeah, yeah. world. Yeah, and that's a good idea. Yeah, so Kaspar was saying EasyBuild is also a platform to, to share expertise and to share whatever is being built on top of EasyBuild and, and maybe yeah, joining forces there a bit yeah. for the, the sites that do have a Cray system makes, uh, makes more so sense. I'm, I'm really not so much asking for more specific support for Cray. Yeah. yeah. But I'm you're... really asking to try to avoid things that can yeah, work also, against what we do. Yeah, but that's also, I mean, that I, as you remark from the yeah. book, I would rather actually invocate the client and then maybe that works rather than just one thousand users. Yeah. I personally have the other one. I would rather have a system telling me this is not supposed to be. I don't know what it's going to do on Cray. I'm not in the easy boat on my Cray. Yeah, but I'm not only talking about Cray systems, you will have exactly the same problems that I run into with any other tool chain which is not part of the common tool chain. Yeah, if we have something sure. LLVM based, you'll have issues like this sure. as well. And I'm pretty sure that. If I don't necessarily deploy it to my local system, I cannot test it. So I might be developing something which is not supposed to be developed, but I cannot actually test it. Because yes, but I you, I mean, I have no idea. you missed the big point that I made. You were talking out of a sysadmin's point of view. I was talking also about of a user's perspective. Yeah, this is a difficult. A user, a user cares in a different way about errors. Yeah. But I'm a user of right? Yeah, but so, I mean, you you really you really think like a user support person or a sys. I mean, I want to be warned when it may not work. Yeah. Sometimes, at least, I see that on Lumi, users are way happier. I mean, they'd rather have something that sometimes doesn't work, but most of the time works, than something that never works. Ah, okay. So then you're thinking about I I give feature to my user. That's and one of the use cases. Yeah, yeah. I, w I think that's, that's the way Spac is being used at the moment on Lumi. Yeah. I, I, I think there's a middle ground there. We, mm -hmm. we could tell if it's that easy to at least try something, right? Like yeah, guess or give, or give a warning rather than completely, yeah. completely fail. And give that, a warning. Look, there is a risk here that we're doing something that is not quite right. Yeah. And that could rather be rather than just say sorry, we don't support this. Yeah. That could be a configuration option. Like, do we want a hard stop if something? Unexpected may happen, or will you at least try and, and see what happens? Like, give me those compiler errors, right? So it's, it's an interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah. So the, yeah. The, the, the comment is that the actual problem that you introduce by just go ahead and try may actually pop up six installations later when that's used as a dependency. Yeah. We, we, sh we should wrap this up. There's yeah. lots of more stuff we can discuss. There's another slot tomorrow 
the ending slot where we, we have about an hour to have open discussions, we can raise some of these points again. Um, and there's, there's just way too much in here to cover everything. <laughs> right? But there's, there's lots, of, lots of these things should become issues um, that we discuss later, maybe on conf calls. Maybe there should be a dedicated follow-up conf call with some of the maintainers on this. Um, and some of these things are relevant in the scope of working towards easy build five. Uh, like the, the way that's that why I wanted to bring them up. Yeah, like the way that we're checking for dependencies in easy blocks, that's maybe something we really need to rethink and redo and come up with a way that that, that we are happy with, but also special cases like Easy and, and Lumi are happy with. Uh, there's a, there's that's another opportunity. And the digital right? research alliance. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and people, similar issues. And the Canadian friends as well. Yeah. Okay, good. Lots of stuff to follow up on. Thanks a lot, good. Yep.